Welcome. Um, uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen the keynote yesterday, but we released uh, a product uh, called SageMaker to allow you to do a, a, a scalable uh, machine learning uh, on AWS. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the algorithms that went into SageMaker and uh, how we deal with them, how we build them. My name is Ido Liberty. I'm the uh, uh, principal scientist and manager of the algorithms group, and we uh, I want to tell you about all the work that went into SageMaker algorithms-wise uh, in the last uh, year and a half. We have T Tom Fahlhaber here, one of our principal engineers who helped build SageMaker. Uh, we are going to uh, cover, for, uh, just for context, what SageMaker is as a whole, uh, and then uh, cover for, uh, very shortly what challenges we see in machine learning and the algorithm space, uh, what design uh, we have chosen for our algorithms and uh, what choices we've made for you, uh, and then go over a few infinitely scalable algorithms, uh, and I'll define what infinitely scalable means, uh, and then in the end I'll just give you a few examples on how, uh, how you can use those algorithms in SageMaker today. Okay. <clears throat> so first thing, what is SageMaker? So SageMaker is a, a platform that allows you to do uh, machine learning and really takes the burden off of a lot of what scientists and engineers do today in production systems that have to do with uh, have to do machine learning, and so we, you know, our view of machine learning is is not different than I guess what most of you already experience, which is there's some exploration phase where scientists or uh, research engineers work with the data, uh, they uh, get insights, they design features, they have some. Uh, more exploration, scientific process. Then there's, uh, there are training jobs, uh, usually on large amounts of data, uh, that contain both the training of the models themselves as well as hyperparameter tuning. So you might have many training jobs simultaneously or one after the other. And once you're done and you have a model you're happy with, you really have to go and host it and make it available to your applications. Uh, and that usually, of course, creates more data uh, which, again, gets fed into farther insights and farther exploration and so on. And uh, we observe that uh, oftentimes the quality of the solution is not necessarily how good the single model is, but rather how many times you went through this cycle, have more insights, understand how what worked, what didn't work, fix it, and do it again and again and again. The, the more times you go around, the better, and SageMaker allows you to make that cycle much tighter than it currently is. So. Let me go through machine learning as a whole right now in, in very broad strokes and what, uh, uh, what our customers tell us is, are, are their challenges. So <clears throat> uh, machine learning really in, in the highest possible level is you take data, you compute, you, you, you compute a model, you, so data plus compute, and you create a function, you create a model, and that model is, is then uh, deployed and used. Again, it's the, the most uh, you know, it's an, uh, uh, insult to the whole field. I mean, this is like the, uh, really too simplistic. But uh, when, we, when we work with our customers, you know, we, most of them have too much data to be crunched on one machine, so they need many machines to do the compute, and they want to compute very uh, complicated models. And so uh, that becomes a significant engineering effort as well. There are many open source and non-open source software solutions that help you do that. Uh, this is really just a, sample, a tiny sample of, of some of those. Uh, uh, but the, each of, and, and every one of those is a significant and pretty, like, uh, pr pretty uh, 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 significant investment software engineering wise to get this uh, to work. Uh, but our customers are still somehow saying that there's something uh, the, the, there's something missing. And if you talk to the large companies out there, all of them wrote at least some of their machine learning stack themselves, and some of them wrote the entire thing from scratch. Okay, and you might understand why it is when you talk when you, you look at those numbers. So, uh, Shahar Sizer from the VP Architecture of uh, IV Digital says that uh, our data warehouse is 100 terabytes. We are processing two terabytes daily. We're running mostly gradient boosted trees, LDA, K means, uh, 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 K means clustering, and collaborative filtering. Okay, this is 
quite a lot of data and they're doing it very on, on a very regular basis. DataZoo has three million ad requests a second with 100,000 100, features per request. That's 150 trillion per day features it is. Uh, and you know that's not your run-of-the-mill data science problem. I completely agree with uh, Bill Simons, the CEO of them, of DataZoo. And Edgerall have 160 million events daily uh, in their ML pipeline. They run training over the last 15 days uh, and need to complete in less than one hour. Okay, there's like, and their models are very big. There's more than 100 million features in, in a single model. And this is uh, Valentino uh, Volonghi, the CTO. Okay. So when you try to deploy systems that have these SLAs uh, and, uh, and need to operate at that scale, uh, the, uh, this, the, the open source software that we talked about just doesn't quite cut it for you. So what are the pain points that they have? First is when you have a, uh, uh, when, you look, when you run a job, it's the trade-off that you get on our like, time and, and uh, cost. Uh, and if you run a job on a single machine, you might uh, be happy with how much it costs, but it might take it weeks, uh, days or weeks to run. You might be able to spin it on a bunch of machines and have a distributed job do the same thing. Uh, it might conclude in hours or maybe even minutes, uh, but it might be very expensive. And so if you look at the Pareto optimal curve uh, that says, like, for every hardware configuration that you can create, you get some uh, trade-off between running time and, and cost that most companies tell us is just not good enough. It's, it's either they want it to go faster or they want it to be cheaper. The second thing is model selection. People say, uh, you know, hyperparameter optimization is hard for them, especially because uh, uh, those jobs are expensive, right? So when they run a job and they want to tweak the parameters, they need to run the exact same job again with slightly different parameters. And if it was expensive before, running it 100 times is 100 times as expensive. Incremental training is also a problem. If you, uh, in the beginning of the talk, I gave the agile example, they train on 15 days of data. What happens when they get the data for the 16th day, they essentially ignore the first and have to train on the second to the 16th day. So days two to, four, days two to 15 have already been processed. And so if you do incremental training, you know, 14 out of 15 days you have already trained on. So that's, you know, that is potentially wasted compute that you could have uh, reused. Uh, and lastly, and maybe probably the biggest pain point, is the production readiness of most of these solutions, okay? Um, we know that uh, when you increase the data size or when you require more complicated, bigger models, uh, they become less stable, they become more numerically sensitive, they become uh, more, you know, you see the more data, it's, it's more prone to be, uh, to have anomalies or just things you haven't considered, and those things tend to be hard to make to harden for production services. And so if you have some le reasonable level of investment, it doesn't matter if your company, it's, it's one person for one week or 100 people for a year, there is something that you're happy to do. And those often intersect uh, that line well below the, the amount of data that you actually have or the complexity of the model that you want. So if you say, I'm happy to invest you know, I'm happy to have two or three guys working on something for three months, and beyond that, I'm not happy to, you know, I'm not happy to do more. Uh, you, your company might have, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 terabytes of data that you've collected, which you cannot use. You might only be able to train on like 10 gigabytes because that's what, you're, what you could build could handle. So, you know, either you've collected too much data and you shouldn't save it, you shouldn't save it uh, or uh, you should use different tools. So, when we started uh, SageMaker, we decided uh, those challenges are algorithmic challenges. The problem is that the algorithms that we have out there just cannot handle these kind of use cases. And we need to really uh, build something from scratch uh, uh, that could solve all these problems in, in one fell swoop. Uh, and so in the, in the next uh, section of the talk, I'm just gonna talk about design principles in the architecture of kind of the data flow of our algorithms. I'm not going to talk about any of the specific algorithms just yet. Okay, so this is this section. The first design choice we've made is we said algorithms are all, our infinitely scalable algorithms are all streaming. Okay, 
That means that they see the data once. They expect to see every data point once, uh, change some internal state, and then never expect to see that data point again. Not only that, their state is finite and fixed in size. So it doesn't matter how much data you stream through, you stream, you stream through the algorithm, uh, that state, that data structure is not going to grow. All right? So the, your mental model of this algorithm should be, I see some piece of data or some mini batch of data, I change my internal representation of what my state should be, and I move on. I forget it and move on. OK? Uh, uh, this, this makes, uh, this has a lot of advantages. Uh, but I want to say, before I, before I go into the advantages, I want to say that if you haven't thought about algorithms running in this mode, you should think about it, because it's fascinating. You could do a lot of really interesting things, but there are a lot of basic things you cannot do. For example, just give, if your data is just a bunch of numbers, you cannot compute their median. Okay? And if you, you, know, you can pretty much convince yourself that in this model, you cannot compute the median. Because to compute the median, you have to store all the numbers, sort, and take the middle one. Right? But you cannot sort if you don't have the data, right? If your, your memory is one megabyte and I stream a terabyte of data through that algorithm, then you cannot sort, right? So the question is, how can you approximate the median? And if you haven't, you know, try to think about it. This is like a take home, uh, uh, you know, brain twister, okay? Uh, but you still can, if you, you know, there is new research to show that you can do a lot of these things surprisingly accurately, okay? The, the engineering advantage, of course, is amazing, right? So the data, the memory footprint of our algorithms are gonna be fixed. It doesn't matter if it's the first or the hundredth gigabyte that you, you stream through the algorithm, the memory footprint is gonna be exactly the same. Moreover, the runtime and the cost are gonna be exactly near with the, the amount of data, right? So if you trained on a terabyte of data and it costs you 12 bucks, if you use another terabyte of data, it costs you exactly 12 bucks more. It's not gonna explode, it's not gonna behave in some weird way. Okay, extremely important. The next thing is incremental training. This was the picture before, right? Used to, if you had days, let's say it's days one and two, and then two and three, uh, the way you can do it now is you can take days one and two, and when you're done with training, just persist the state. Just save it, serialize it. And when you get the data for the third day, uh, just deserialize the state, you know, restart the machine to exactly where it was before, and, and process day number three. So the advantage, of course, is that you've saved compute because now you don't have to retrain on day number two. But there's another advantage. Now your machine learning model actually consists of days one, two, and three. You don't really have to choose how far back you go. You just trained on all of the history. So it's both faster and cheaper and more accurate. Okay, so it's a slam dunk. But this wasn't enough. We said, we, okay, they're streaming, that's good, but they still need to be more efficient. So the first thing we did, we said, okay, all our algorithms are gonna be able to work both on CPU and GPU, and whenever you run them on a GPU machine, you will try to take as much advantage as you can from that machine and reduce your running time. The next thing is distribution, right? So now, uh, the obvious next step is to say, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, because our algorithms, tr uh, 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 scale exactly linearly, if I give each machine a third of the data, it would run in a third of the time, you know, three, three times faster. Uh, which, of course, uh, we support and we allow you to do that. Uh, but the obvious problem with that is that the state that each machine has might diverge, right? And so once you, you're done training, you're not even exactly sure what to do. Uh, so we've actually have, we actually have a, another component of this thing that, that uh, uh, creates a shared state. It's another uh, set of processes that their whole job is to make sure that there is a global state that uh, all these machines share. And so their local state is almost fully synchronized with the, with the global state. Uh, and each machine just does something very simple. It just sees the data batch and, and changes the local state and the, and, the, and the shared state, the parameter server is, is uh, synchronizes it all with the different machines. 
what you get is that if you had that Pareto optimal curve of performance that you could before, then we see significantly improved performance in terms of cost versus running time. And by the way, all these, when I, when I plot these things, you have to remember that this is for a given level of accuracy, okay? If you're not required to keep the same accuracy, I can be very fast. I can just say, you know, just give you a blank model, you know. Uh, so this, you know, you have to always keep in mind that, you know, you want to be, you want to play fair and make sure that you, you, you get to a specific accuracy and then see how much it cost you and how long it took you to run. Uh, the last design choice we've made is, uh, you know, we, because, uh, we, uh, because we assume this uh, one pass model, uh, we know that we can ingest kinesis streams as input streams, right? And so if your model, if you're not happy with the parameters you've set in the beginning, uh, if your data is on S3, you can rerun the training. But if your data is a kinesis stream, you cannot go back and say, you know, give me the entire stream. It doesn't exist anymore. It's just gone, right? And so we want to make sure that from the state that you have, you can actually generate a lot of different models. You can do some of that exploration post-training, okay? And not only uh, pre-training. Uh, which, of course, gives you the added advantage that when you do hyperparameter optimization, uh, you don't, the picture doesn't look like that. You don't reprocess the same, uh, same data twice. You can actually finish the training and then take the state and, and generate a few different models. Just to give you an example, when you do clustering, usually you have to choose the number of clusters ahead of time. With our implementation of clustering, you just say, I want up to 500 clusters, say. And when you're done, you can say, okay, does, you know, please generate a model with 100, okay? And see how that works for you. If that's good enough, great. If not, maybe I should try 200, right? And all those could be possible from that uh, state. And I wanna say, it doesn't just pick the first 100 or the first 200. That's not, that doesn't give you actually a good solution. If you ask for 100 or 200, those are processes that actually, that those are probably not overlap at all. Uh, and the last thing that we get is because we have decided to work in this unified framework, we can abstract away most of the uh, heavy lifting for algorithms into a very thick SDK that we have. And we are able to actually have each one of the algorithms be uh, relatively small in, 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 uh, in terms of amount of code. Uh, and we are able to run, kind of develop on a dev desktop uh, on a kind of CPU machine and, and containerize and run it uh, on a distributed GPU environment in SageMaker pretty much right there with all the testing and regressions and everything already happening. All right. What you get is this uh, production ready environment, uh, uh, not only from the algorithms, but also from SageMaker, that once you get it to run, essentially it just runs. If it ran on a gigabyte of data, it will run on a terabyte, on 100 terabytes. I mean, as long as you keep it running, it will run, okay? Um, so these, are, these were the design principles that we, uh, uh, that we chose. I wanna go into the actual algorithms that you would have uh, if, if you log into SageMaker today. Uh, um, yeah, let's, let's go into that. Unfortunately, I would not be able to go very deep into exactly how everything works. Uh, I hope to leave a few, at least a few minutes for questions later. All right. Uh, the first algorithm is linear regression and linear classification. Uh, uh, both very simple models, but maybe because of their simplicity and the way that, because we know pretty much everything there is to know about them, they're very, uh, uh, they're very uh, uh, useful and very common. What we've done with, uh, what we've done with uh, uh, linear regression and with binary classification is that we've decided uh, we notice that, that people don't, uh, we notice that people actually don't usually optimize for the thing that they really care about. So with linear regression or with linear classification, people use hinge loss or square loss or log loss, but what they really care about is AUC or zero one loss, what's just a mistake, number of mistakes or some F1 measure, okay? 
what we do for what we do internally in SageMaker is we will train on a bunch of different uh, on a bunch of different regularizations, lost functions, and uh, uh, different settings of the algorithm itself, including different learning rates and so on. And we do this all internally in GPU, so that is super efficient. So it's actually not much less efficient to just training one model. And by the end of the process, when you just try to fit for your, if you're trying to get good AUC, or if you're trying to get good uh, mistake count or some F1 measure, then uh, uh, we do that by taking linear combinations of those models, something that's much more efficient, okay? So if you look at uh, what, what happens when you run SageMaker in regression or classification, uh, uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, we match almost uh, everywhere uh, the type of accuracy that we could get from other tools. Uh, our algorithm requires essentially zero <coughs> training, a zero uh, tweaking kind of worked out of the box. Uh, and for the same running time, if you look at the right, so again, this is the plot that we said. There's the running time on the, on the bottom and cost on the, on the, on the y-axis. For the, if you're trying to shoot for a five minute uh, uh, running time ballpark, then you get, a, you get a, a 40 cents on the dollar saving just for running uh, in SageMaker. The next algorithm is factorization machines. In factorization machines, it's, it's a generalization of linear regression uh, in the sense that in linear regression, usually you, you, uh, uh, you, you can think about it as, as assigning a weight for each feature. And in factorization machines, you're actually assigning a, a full k-dimensional vector for each feature. And then your prediction is of this form. It's the sum of all interactions and dot products of those features in the, in the example that you have, plus a, linear, uh, plus a linear term. So if you, get, if, you put, if you set all the vi's and vj's to zero, you get the linear model. Okay, so this is a generalization of that. Uh, the best tool that we know about, the most common tool that people use for factorization machines, could only work on one machine. Uh, so what we're showing you here is that not only do we match the accuracy when you kind of compare in, in, in throughput, when uh, compare log loss and F1 score, uh, we are uh, as accurate as, as the other solution, but we also scale completely linearly. So on the right-hand side, you see the running time when you train on uh, all the way from 10 to 50 machines, and you see exactly, almost exactly a five times speed up. Okay? So you get the same performance and same speed, on a single machine, but then infinite scaling on the number of machines. Okay? And by the way, this is, uh, I don't know if you'll see on the left-hand side, training on a terabyte of, of advertising data, which uh, is not, uh, usually not an easy task. Uh, here cost us on SageMaker roughly uh, somewhere between 80 and $100. Okay? This is in compute. It's not, uh, Huge amount. K-means. Uh, in K-means, you're, uh, you're expected to find centers for points. So you have points in high dimensional space, these XIs, and you're expected to find uh, centers, mu j here. Uh, and the measure of error is the average square distance, or the, just the sum of square distances from every point to its closest center. Okay? It's a very common thing, probably one of the most common uh, clustering algorithms. Uh, the best known solution for that uh, uh, is the Lloyd's algorithm. It's an iterative uh, EM type algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's a batch process. You have to have the data in, in memory. There's, there's hundreds, uh, actually thousands of publications on k-means and making it more efficient, including some of mine. Uh, unfortunately, we came into this problem. We figured when we try to match the accuracy of Lloyd's, with the performance of the streaming algorithms, we found that there is, we couldn't really find one of the published variants that, that actually does that. Uh, and we had to redesign the algorithm from scratch to be both provably correct to work in one pass and produce, empirically produce good results as, as good as, as Lloyd's. By the way, k-means is a, is a, uh, it's a computationally, like provably computationally hard problem. So there's, you can like, you can't provably solve it. You can only approximate the solution. And so, if we compare the solution of k-means 
to the best iterative algorithm, we see that it actually matches all the accuracies on, uh, on the left-hand side. So this is the sum of square distances. Uh, and it matches those accuracies on the instances we were actually able to run some other solution. If you try to run uh, on, if we try to run it on 127 gigabytes of memory with 500 clusters, we just couldn't get other solutions to work. They just crapped out on us, okay? Uh, our, our algorithm had no problem with it. Uh, th on the right-hand side is actually a different algorithm. It's the fastest algorithm we could find outside of SageMaker. And you can see that for the same, uh, uh, for when we try uh, for different values of k, different values of numbers of clusters, our algorithm runs roughly 10 times faster. PCA. PCA is, is uh, probably the uh, oldest workhorse of, of, uh, of data mining and machine learning, on unsupervised machine learning. Uh, it's used for dimension reduction, for signal denoising. It's been around since the early uh, 19th century. Uh, early, yeah, no, no, whatever. It's been around for a long time. It's like Pearson correlation. You can, you can think that that's uh, essentially that. Uh, so the question is how to how to compute uh, PCA quickly and efficiently. Uh, Again, this is uh, something that I myself spent a long time researching. This is, uh, there's some uh, surprising results there. Uh, when you do it with uh, SageMaker today, you are, we're actually able to accelerate this algorithm in a very significant way. There is both a deterministic and a randomized version of our algorithm available for you. The randomized one is slightly less accurate, but, way, but faster. And you can see that even the slower algorithm that we have is significantly faster, more than 10 times, way more than 10 times faster than the best out of the solution that we can uh, find. And it costs like cents on the dollar, uh, compute-wise. If you look at the right, it just shows you the linear, the almost perfect scalability uh, horizontally. So if you look at the uh, megabytes per second per machine, the, run, the randomized algorithm gets slightly more than 100 megabytes per second per machine. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you spin up eight or 10 or 20 machines, it, just, it just remains the same. The best we could get out of the competition was about uh, slightly less than 10. Uh, neural topic modeling. Topic modeling as a whole has to do with uh, finding, uh, uh, assigning, uh, 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 Assign, so creating topics, topics are distributions over words, and, and then describing uh, uh, documents as distribution over topics. Okay, so let me give you an example. If you have, if you have a, a, an article about uh, you know, football injuries, it might be, you know, you might be a mix of a, of a topic about medicine or uh, injuries and you know, sports, okay? And given a corpus of uh, a corpus of text, the 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 goal is to find those topics and to model the data this way. By the way, text and and documents is you know could be replaced with pretty much any set of tokens. It doesn't have to be text. It could, people do today uh, neural top, uh, topic modeling on images on many different things. But the kind of the mental model of text is is not a bad one. And when you when you uh, train a neural top so when you train a neural topic modeling on uh, on uh, this data set, and this is just an example, it actually works for uh, most data sets that we've tried, you get significant lifts uh, in terms of log loss. So you actually get more accurate models than you could otherwise and still work in this uh, environment that I told you about. The last item in the, this uh, part of the talk is uh, time series forecasting. This is an algorithm that we have used internally in Amazon for a long time for forecasting a lot of different things. Uh, you can imagine uh, you know, getting stuff to your doorstep in time requires a lot of different forecasting as having the items and you know, the, the traffic. And like everything needs to be kind of, you have to figure out a lot of things and you have to be able to forecast a lot of things. Uh, uh, the, uh, the most uh, straightforward competitor to the kinds of algorithm that we are releasing uh, it's actually available in R, but we were not able to run it on the largest examples, and we're uh, pretty consistently more accurate than what you could get 
uh, with other algorithms. And by the way, if you look at uh, the large prediction job at like 180 time sequence, uh, time, 180k time sequences that couldn't be run on R, here uh, with SageMaker it's roughly one hour on a P2 instance, which costs roughly one dollar. Not bad. I want to also say that uh, except for algorithms that work in this model, we have a few more great algorithms that we decided to put in because customers said that they wanted to have them. And uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, an algorithm is not streaming, is not infinitely scalable, doesn't mean it's not great and it's not usable. Uh, in fact, some of the best algorithms that we have uh, don't work in this way. So first of all, we've uh, included Spectral LDA. It's, it's another topic modeling algorithm that uh, should work, again, more than 10 times faster on, on um, medium, t uh, medium type, medium sized data sets. Uh, and that's the same algorithm that you'll be, uh, 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 you know, you'll be able to use this algorithm also as a part of Comprehend, which is another service for text analytics that we've uh, released uh, yesterday. The next is XGBoost. It's one of the most uh, commonly used algorithms for, for decision trees. Uh, out there, uh, it's it's available as a part of SageMaker, uh, and uh, we actually work quite a lot to optimize it for you. Make sure it runs on the right instances, that the communication is optimized, that the distribution is done correctly, and so uh, you see here we just measured the running time and the throughput that we get out of 64 uh, C48 uh, 8x large machines. And you get roughly 1.3 gigabyte per second. That's just not uh, unimpressive, in my opinion. The next one is sequence to sequence. Uh, so it's based off of uh, Sokai, which is a, uh, a project for doing uh, machine translation. It's an open source project for doing machine translation. Uh, we have an internal implementation of it and integration of it into, into a uh, into SageMaker, uh, you see that when you use uh, uh, when you use our sequence to sequence pretty much out the box uh, uh, on on a, a translation data from English to German, after a few hours you pretty much converge to the best possible, the best known result, the best published result, which is uh, this in terms of the blue score. It's kind of the standout measurement of of uh, translation quality. I want to say also that you know, it also lets you kind of uh, tweak the algorithm and choose either uh, RNNs or CNNs as an encoder and decoders. Uh, and the last algorithm that I'll be talking about is the uh, is image classification. A lot of you, uh, a lot of our customers said that they have image data that they want to work with. And while there are these uh, publications and, you know, there's these uh, uh, open sources and so on that let you featureize images and so on, they're not quite as available as they would have wanted, okay? And so we've re-implemented ResNet uh, in this framework. Uh, we're gonna include more uh, standard networks coming soon, uh, such as DenseNet and uh, uh, Inception and, ma and maybe others. And so uh, you can now essentially use those things out of the box, take image data and, and, and train on it directly with your labels in SageMaker uh, today. You want to say that one of the coolest features about this algorithm is that it comes with uh, the ability to do transfer, transfer learning out the gate. Most of the, you know, in many cases I should say, you don't have enough, quite enough labeled images to, to train a great classifier. Those, those are complex models that require hundreds or, uh, sorry, millions sometimes, or at least tens of thousands of images. Uh, and uh, if you don't have enough, your model just is not going to converge, right? So what we've done is we've actually created a pre-trained models on, on pre-trained network on ImageNet, which is one of the uh, largest classified uh, uh, image data sets out there. So you can, try and you can start your training from an already trained model and just adapt it to your data set, which shows great uh, uh, value. And on the right, I'm just showing the speed up if you, you know, if you scale it to more machines. So you actually get uh, almost linear scale up uh, if, if you want to train faster. The last, the last comment that I want to say is that 
you know, you should go to the Amazon SageMaker documentation and look at the algorithms that explain much better, uh, much in much better detail. Uh, and all of these algorithms have many pending improve improvements uh, that, that are going to be shipped regularly over the next few months. Uh, documentation and more examples are coming, more documentation, more examples are coming, and more algorithms are coming. So this list is going to become longer and longer over time. Okay, so I, if you, if you need large scale algorithms, you know, frequent that page, just go, go there every month and see what's new. Okay? The last thing we'll cover is uh, how to use uh, how to use Amazon SageMaker algorithms uh, in uh, you know on AWS. All right. So you might think that uh, using those. So we we talked about streaming data in S3 and Kinesis and you know and parameter servers and shared stuff. And this, that whole, this whole thing like, looks like a pretty complex setup. And you might think it's, it's pretty hard to run. But in fact, SageMaker makes it incredibly simple to run those things. So the first uh, obvious thing, uh, the, the, the first thing you can do is essentially call those algorithms directly through the command line for SageMaker, from SageMaker, like through SageMaker. So you put your profile and your, uh, your role, and then you name the job, basically. And you know, this is just an example uh, uh, command line run of, of, of uh, I think it's k-means. Uh, yeah, it's k-means, yeah. And you see, this is, again, you pretty much had to set up nothing, right? You, you just specify the data set and the type of algorithm that you want, the features that you want for the algorithm, so number of clusters and so on. Uh, the, you point it to the data in S3. And you essentially tell it how much and what kind of hardware you want it to use. OK, and that's it. That's, that's the first example. The second example is something that I'm uh, uh, personally very excited about, is that we, uh, we make this accessible directly through Spark. Uh, that, uh, so now you can, you can actually take those algorithms and use them as uh, estimators and transformers in your Spark cluster. Okay, and note that uh, when you do this, the algorithm doesn't actually run on the Spark cluster that you have. It utilizes uh, SageMaker hardware, and that's very important because the type of hardware that you use for ETL jobs is usually very different than the kind of hardware that you need for crunching those machine learning algorithms. So you might, while you might need ten, you know, high memory. Not very, not very strong CPU-wise machines to run your ETL. If to train your deep learning model, you might need a very strong, like three, you know, P2 instances, right? If you try to do all of that on the same hardware, you will end up paying, you know, paying too much or having poor performance, right? And so what happens when I run fit here at the bottom? Uh, it actually creates the call and, and trains the data on on SageMaker. Uh, you'll see, by the way, that you can, of course, then uh, use uh, transform on it. One of the coolest thing here, and you know, I think maybe this, uh, uh, you know, so one one of the things that so let me say this: when you run k-means, it might not look very impressive because, yeah, it might have, it might be faster or something. But I already have k-means in Spark from Spark ML, uh, but you can do this now with XGBoost. Okay, so now you can run you know, XGBoost on 64 machines from your Spark pipeline, which if, I mean, without this would be, I wouldn't want to do it. The, uh, the next and uh, 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 I think simplest and most straightforward example for uh, how you should be uh, using this is from Sage SageMaker notebooks themselves. Uh, with uh, so SageMaker comes with host and notebooks. Uh, you can open and create a session. Essentially, uh, the part of the notebook that just trains the job looks like this. You create a session. Uh, you create a uh, SageMaker estimator. You give it uh, the hardware and the uh, kind of the configuration that the uh, the estimator needs. You set the parameters for the job, and you try and uh, run fit. 
on it. Uh, and again, this doesn't happen on the notebook. It happens in the uh, distributed containerized environment that we talked about. And the most exciting thing is, or oh, one of the most exciting things is, uh, when you're done with this from the notebook directly, you can deploy your model. So here it's PCA. But what deploy does is actually push the model and put it behind an HTTPS endpoint and makes it immediately available for your applications. So if it's XGBoost or, uh, or image classification or k-means or PCA or linear learner or whatever it is your model is, you can directly from the notebook host it and have it available for your applications in like pretty much immediately thereafter. Okay. So I want to wrap up and leave some time for questions. Uh, you know, with just telling you, you know, just telling you, go to SageMaker. Uh, you know, this is what you'll get. You can create your own notebooks. Uh, you'll go in. You'll have a, a lot of example notebooks that show you how to do some stuff. Uh, play with it. Figure out how to use it. If you come up with great usage uh, examples, you figure out you can do cool things with it. Blog about it. Tell us about it. We'd love to hear those stories. If you find something, uh, if you find that you really want to do something that it's is actually not very easy to do or that you think we should enable, we'd even be happier to learn about that. Uh, and with that, I will conclude. They'll be happy to take questions. What about normalization of data? So the question is, what, what about normalization of data? Right, so the the pre like the okay, so <clears throat> the uh, so first of all, you can use uh, Spark and you can use other tools for ETL jobs, you know, in the notebook or from uh, uh, Spark directly or other tools that you have. We have, you know, Glue and and other, uh, of course, EMR for doing that. Uh, we specifically, in this context, focused on getting the machine learning done at scale and in, in, at speed and not trying to reinvent ETL as a whole. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we know that this is something that, that people need. Again, sorry? How easy is it to fit your own model into it like from scratch? Oh, good. Uh, excellent. So th one thing I didn't go into is actually the bring your own model or bring your own, you know, so we have, so the, uh, so m algorithms as a whole in SageMaker are encapsulated in containers. And you can pretty much bring your own container. You can put whatever you want in it. I didn't go into, again, with SageMaker you can run just generic TensorFlow, MXNet, whatever deep learning you want. You can pretty much run whatever algorithm you want. We provide you a lot of tools on how to containerize some of them. If you, whatever wacky thing you can come up with, if you can conform to the container specifications, which are, it's pretty unopinionated, it's kind of a pretty straightforward thing, you can run it on SageMaker. So you could, you don't have to use our training environment, for example, to use our hosting. You can bring our own, you can, you know, if you, if you specify the algorithm, you can train it, or if you just specify a model container, you can host it. Okay. Um, so the question is about cross-validation. I mean, what we do about it. So it's a great question because we've we've uh, tr we, we thought about uh, incorporating kind of best practices in machine learning into the framework, and uh, we decided against it. And we decided against it because there are. 500 different ways to do it, and everybody has their own way. We can offer some ideas on how you should or shouldn't be doing machine learning. We should we, we design algorithms that try to not overfit when you can, but we try to be unopinionated in the sense that you know if you run whatever you're used to doing, you should be doing that, and you know will enable you to do that faster, easier, more you know 
let you know more frictionless. But when we don't want to, you know, we don't want to enforce any type of like validation schema on you. Or like ten cross validation or whatever, all that stuff. I mean, this is. Uh, Exactly. So if you need to do cross validation, you should just run testing on, you know. Again, we, we can think about it if that becomes an issue. We can we can always at the very least give examples on how it it should be done or maybe even create like a full That's a great question, and again, something we struggled with quite a lot. Uh, you know, we built SageMaker essentially as three different services, actually probably four or five, but mainly three main parts, which is the notebooks and the, tra you know, the exploration, the training, and the hosting. And uh, we wanted to make it, you wanted to pick kind of a la carte, right? So if you want to do just one or not the other, you can pretty much mix and match and you know do whatever you want. Some people have a great training environment and they really need hosting on, or vice versa, right? And then your question comes into, you know, I trained a model on SageMaker. Now I want to use it in my, my environment. I want to deploy it in my, not in SageMaker, say. How do you do that? Option number one and the one that I would think is the most straightforward is to take the container as is. And there's entry points to the container so that you can deploy, you know, you can use the container itself as, as uh, in your system, right? So it, outside, of outside of AWS. So you don't have, I mean, so you, uh, 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 you know, so you would have like the logic and the, you know, everything that you need to do that inside the container, right? I think that's the most uh, uh, safe, kind of sane way to do this, right? I think so. Uh, Tom, do we? Uh, is the feature of of uh, 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 pulling the container, the, the SageMaker container, uh, is that is that possible today? I'm not sure. Like when you finish training. Well, do, we, do we need to code the Java code to parse the models in S3, or is the container readily available for? So if it's your container of the, uh, or kind of the more the uh, deep learning or other of the kind of standard containers, you you could get the the container itself, I believe. Our algorithms, I'm not sure you'll be able to actually get the container itself. You might you might need to be you might need to deploy with AWS. Uh, not yet. The question was, does we, do we support Cloud9? 
Right, so uh, we don't directly support Cloud9, but you should be able to use all these tools from Cloud9. We haven't actually tried it yet. It's on our, it's on our agenda. But so, so it's an important point. All these SageMaker tools are kind of usable from anywhere you can get access. We provide the Jupyter Notebook that, get, that lets you uh, just get on board and start playing super easily through your AWS uh, console. But if you have your own Jupyter installation, if you're using Cloud9, if you're, I, one of my colleagues is like, why would anyone use anyone anything but Vim to write programs, right? <laughs> that's, that's not my opinion exactly, but that's a, that's a perfectly acceptable one and, and, you, can, you, and you can do that. Yeah. So, calling prediction, there are two ways to call prediction, which are basically identical, but which one you choose depends on the rest of your environment. Um, once you've deployed a model, you can use a standard Amazon a API, it's a SIG v4 authenticated API, to call from a Lambda function or call anywhere else to get a new prediction, right? So from your Java web server um, or your web app, um, any, any intermediate app, anywhere you need inference, you can just call and get it. Um, and this is, of, of course, the great advantage of deployment. It's available anywhere. Um, users who don't want to, who, who for whatever reason don't want to use the SDKs directly, Amazon, you know, the Boto or the Java um, Builder SDKs, um, can uh, just do HTTP. The magic is you got to do the SIG4, SIG v4 auth, which is documented but a little tricky. But otherwise, you do in your Lambda function, say, Python, you just call Boto into the uh, uh, Yeah, it's yeah. super simple. and. You can you can just copy the prediction examples that we have in the notebooks and just do it. We, you can also so we have two levels of interaction at the Python level. Um, we have the the standard AWS API, the Boto calls, um, which work at any, in any language in the GoLang or wherever you are. Um, we also have a Python SDK, which is what Ido was showing there, where where it looks a lot more like sort of a traditional scikit learn environment, um, and it's just a little bit easier to to deal with. Um, I I prefer that one, but uh, um, but I use both. How are we on time, by the way? I have, uh... okay, well, I, can, I guess we can do one quick one question. Well, one. Yeah. So is there a particular encoding of uh, features that, you, that you better works with, with SageMaker uh, as an interpretation of you know, what these vector, vector components mean as an encoding? Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So there's, 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 a, there's an input format that you pretty much have to co conform to. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean it's it's an input format. It's like it could be. For example, in Spark, you know, some models, you know, are better with some kind of a coding, like one hot, you know, some others, you know, do like string indexing. Is right. there a specific is that part of the implementation of each algorithm or is it? Uh, not exactly. So I think you know this again. You know, we, these are great discussions because you're touching on a lot of the things that we struggled with, right, uh, in designing this product, and uh, we. We really we decided to be as unopinionated as we can and to not, not enforce our convictions on, on customers. And uh, you know whether you believe one hot encoding is better for RNNs than something else, then you know go right ahead and do it. Uh, you know we try to just support every possible thing. We'll try in the documentation just say, you know we think this works better, but basically you know we try to let you do pretty much whatever you want. All right, so I think we're out of time, right? All right. Thank you.